Good afternoon, teammates. I'm joined here with most excellent surgeon, Dr. Pearson. Uh, it has been a long time since we have done a virtual town hall. I think the 5th of, Feb of February. This is our 40th virtual town hall that we've been doing for over the last year. I'm going to talk about a number of things today. Uh, talk, of course, we got to talk about uh, the snowstorm last week. Uh, we're going to talk about the vaccine. We're going to talk about return to the workplace uh, and close, in, close up by uh, just reminding everybody about our, our Black History Month uh, uh, ceremony today, uh, later on this afternoon. Uh, but, uh, and then we'll take some questions, of course, to make sure we, we get uh, to hear what you're saying out uh, in the field. Uh, so last week, uh, I think we all track and snowstorm up several inches, first time in over 30 years that we've had such a weather occurrence here in San Antonio. Uh, and I got to tell you, the entire team did exceptionally well. Uh, everybody from our, our G4, our G9, the drill sergeants, company commanders, battalion commanders, the entire the staff, everybody making sure that uh, our soldiers were taken care of. We had a number of building failures. Shouldn't be a surprise. We know we've got aging infrastructure. Uh, and when I say failures, I mean water, heat, power. Uh, and we had to move over a thousand soldiers to different buildings to ensure, make sure they were warm. Here's what I'll tell you. Uh, all our soldiers were warm. They had water and they had power. Uh, we, had to, we did have to go to MREs, but they also had bottled water in which to drink. And the chain of command did a fantastic job. And I also want to put a shout out uh, for uh, uh, the 502nd Air Base Wing and partnering with them uh, to making sure that they responded to our concerns as they came up. We were able to help out the commissary with soldiers to restock shelves. Uh, we were able to put some soldiers in the G4 warehouse and the dining facilities as well uh, and make sure that the, that the mission continued here. Uh, so the million dollar question. Uh, we basically, uh, most of the training was curtailed. We put some of it out into the virtual space. We are looking very hard and making sure that we can make up the program of instruction time without having to shift graduation dates to the right. We'll let you know how that goes. I, I, think, I think we're going to do okay on that. And if there's a situation that comes up where we can't, we'll share that with you next Friday and, and give you the latest on that. But I want to thank everybody. Uh, the entire community. Now, uh, in the midst or the prelude to that storm, uh, we did something significant, and that is that we shipped our 10,000th COVID-free soldier from AIT to first unit of assignment. Um, and we made a big deal of that. You may have seen it on, on social media. Uh, 10,000 soldiers, not one sick, uh, and that all gets to readiness. The training pipeline. Uh, from MEPS to BCT to AIT to first unit of instruction or first unit of assignment continued. And I thank everybody out there uh, for making this happen. That was a huge, huge accomplishment. So about mid-March, uh, we anticipate that we are going to graduate our 20,000 student from the many courses that we teach here. And we're going to do the same thing uh, and have a big deal about it. Lots of Lots of uh, visibility on social media, and we're going to talk that up as much as we can. Because our academic staff has done a great job in making sure that we continue to execute those programs. So much has been put out into uh, the virtual space. But once again, I find myself dominating the conversation and being insensitive and disrespectful to our honored guest. And do you have any remarks that you would like to start with? Yeah, absolutely, sir. So I just wanted to say that whatever you call this, the last you know winter wonderland that we had, whether it's Snowmageddon or Snowvid 2021, there's been a lot of things on the internet. Uh, I just wanted to point out there's a lot of fabulous videos that are on our MedCOE website. Yeah. Um, I know you got a chance to get out there, sir, yeah. and get in the snow uh, with some of our soldiers. So some awesome video footage that you should really take a look at. Um, and I would be amiss if I didn't mention, so we're coming into the month of March, and I vividly remember a year ago, uh, this COVID was something, you know, that we saw on the news, but it really wasn't, you know, in our face, it wasn't, you know, in our lives. Um, but after spring break, uh, I vividly remember schools closing, uh, students didn't go back to school, and that's kind of what started all of this. So it has been a year um, that we have been 
you know, dealing with the COVID pan COVID-19 pandemic. And so we've made some incredible milestones uh, as far as medical advancements and the vaccine uh, that has been put out. Um, we have surpassed a very grim milestone. So uh, over 500,000 people have died from COVID-19. So um, just keep them in your prayers, keep their families in their prayers. Um, I also want to mention that the people who have had COVID-19, a lot of them are dealing with uh, different issues uh, related to long-term complications of COVID-19 as well. And so we're going to see more literature, more medical information, you know, come out on that as well. Um, the flip side, uh, like I said, uh, from all the grim stuff that we've been dealing with are the really good things and the things that are exciting for me as a physician seeing all the medical advances and the medical community uh, come together from all aspects, not even just physicians, it's the pre-hospital workers, it's the people who work in labs, it's the people who make all of the equipment you know, to make all of this stuff possible. It has been a phenomenal effort all year and it has been a privilege to be a part of that and this is certainly gonna be something you know, that I'm gonna be uh, reading about in you know, my grandchildren, hopefully, uh, textbooks you know, to come in the future. Um, a few things have changed, especially with regard to vaccines, that information that I wanted to put forward. Um, BAMSI vaccination site has changed. It used to be at the hospital, but BAMSI has established the vaccination site and it is on Main Fort Sam. This is gonna be the site going forward that people will go to to receive their COVID vaccines. So it is at the Training Support Center Building 4110, and that's located on 2536 Garden Avenue. Um, and people will be able to get appointments. And it's really important to know that you shouldn't just show up at this uh, location. It is a well-oiled machine that they are working on uh, to establish uh, efficiencies. Um, and you will, get, you will need an appointment to go there uh, for your vaccine. Right now, um, we are currently still working on our tiers, and it's a tiered system, how we're getting everybody vaccinated. So we want everybody to be vaccinated, but it's a tiered system. So right now, we're still on 1Bs. Um, and if you have already either had your first vaccine um, or you are waiting for your second vaccine uh, appointment, you can look on TRICARE online. Um, and uh, that will help determine uh, when your appointment slot is. I believe you can also call the camo line, but a little bit easier to go online and check yourself to see if you have been scheduled for a second uh, vaccine or even for the first vaccine. BAMC has now taken over uh, that um, effort, that line of effort, um, and will be scheduling everybody. If you're not sure about your prioritization, you should check with your unit to make sure uh, that you are on the prioritization either for 1B, 1C, or 2, wherever your unit may have placed you. So that's how we're doing it right now going forward. Okay. Um, get the shot. Uh, lots of discussion at the national level about the shot. Should you not get it? Is it effective? Has it been rushed? Uh, is it real? Uh, is it a secret plot to, to all of that? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, I believe in the shot, I believe in all the testing uh, that has occurred with the vaccine to make sure that it was safe before they administered it to us. And, and I believe it so much, and I think I've already said that I've had both injections, but I pushed for my family to get it too. Uh, and that's kind of my measure, my personal measure of anything. Do I believe in something so much that I would want uh, uh, my son to have, and I do want him to have that shot. And, and uh, I can't overstate that. It's not mandatory. Uh, DOD personnel are not, are not required to take it, but it's, it's plausible that at some point it could be mandatory in the future. I would, I would encourage you to look at it from the perspective that um, you're protecting yourself and you're protecting others. So when, when do these things go away? And no one really likes these. These have been part of our bodies now for the last year. Uh, you, you, you step out of the car without it, and you immediately feel like you, you left something in there and something isn't right. Um, and so this is kind of what I'm hearing. And these numbers may change, and we'll keep you informed. But the dialogue kind of goes like this. Uh, the masks can go away. 
uh, when we hit herd immunity. Uh, and, and, and I'm, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to explain herd immunity in just a second. Just so, and I'm, I'm wildly off script right now, uh, but that's okay. Um, so the masks come off when we hit herd immunity. And what, when do we decide, what's the trigger to say we've, we've now achieved herd immunity? It's roughly somewhere between 70 to 80 percent uh, have been vaccinated. Uh, and then we can start seeing the effects of herd immunity. And then we know that we're getting uh, COVID under control. And that's when we'll probably see decisions as to when we can take the mask off. But I just want to pass that to you for some amplification. Yes, absolutely. So what basically what herd immunity is, is when a certain percentage of the population so there's been numbers that have, you've seen on the uh, on social media, somewhere between 65 to 80 percent of the population either has had antibodies produced by having the infection themselves or by getting vaccinated. And basically what that does is, you know, COVID-19 won't go away immediately, like we have eradicated some other illnesses. But the spread of it will be uh, substantially much slower because everybody is vaccinated. Um, so right now we have in, in this country, we have about 83 million cases. Um, and so we're about a third of the way to herd immunity. And by cases, um, I either mean people who are vaccinated or people who have it. So, so people who have antibodies. So a third of the way there. So if we continue on the, the trajectory to get to that magic, like around 70%, um, the way we're going with the vaccine, vaccine, vaccination efforts, um, hopefully by this summer or later this fall, we'll, we'll get to that herd immunity um, magic place. I will say that it's been interesting as a physician, especially working in the emergency department, with the utilization of masks and how we've implemented it, we've hardly seen any influenza this season at all. So it has been- Really? Uh, yeah, so the, those rates have been astronomically low. Um, we have, we just, I haven't even seen one um, in working in the emergency department. So, and I know a lot of my colleagues haven't seen any at all. And if you go to the rates on CDC website, they're also extremely low. So other kinds of infectious diseases we are helping to squelch this season as well as the vaccination efforts uh, for influenza. So I'm gonna throw you a curveball, okay? It's okay <laughs> but I, th I, like I think it's important because <laughs> I, I imagine that there's gonna be a question that comes up on this. But you know, there's lots of, there's lots of talk about um, uh, variants of COVID. And would you have any, any comments on, on what, what they may be and, and how we would probably go about mitigating those? So all viruses will mutate at some point. And getting to that point where we achieve herd immunity suppresses the ability for the virus to mutate and try to um, you know, progress into um, you know, keeping itself alive. And so with those variants, we're seeing in the literature now that most of the vaccines that we have and most of the ones that aren't even approved yet, they're still testing them against these new variants. Um, we're seeing a good efficacy for it. It may be a little bit lower, but what we're seeing with these vaccines as far as the efficacy is much higher than other vaccines that we have as well. So I'm very helpful in seeing the literature. I think time will tell. Um, in terms of what research they get on it, um, whether or not we need booster shots, booster immunization. So for example, like with influenza, we get our vaccine every year because we know those antibodies wane uh, as time goes on. So we're thinking that probably that will be the case, but we don't know yet. Um, the first people to have the vaccine were, you know, a little bit more, a little less than a year out now. So, you know, those folks will have, you know, research and blood drawn to see if they still have antibody levels. Um, so time will tell. Um, we'll get smarter on this uh, as we get more research. Thank you. You're no welcome. more curveballs. <laughs> it's here. okay. Uh, We're good with curveballs, sir. <laughs> so I just want to state again, I, I, I believe in the scientific process and the scientific rear that's got into this vac these vaccines. Uh, I believe in Army senior leaders. I believe in Department of Defense senior leaders. And I know uh, they all have families and they wouldn't want any of their family members or their soldiers to have something that was unsafe. And I believe that with all my heart. It's not mandatory yet. For those who are skeptical, I, I ask that you consider what we said. 
uh, and, and consider getting the vaccine if your position is that you, you are opposed to it at this point. So I'd like to switch gears, uh, and I'm sure there's some questions coming in, and we'll, we'll field those. Um, I'd like to switch gears and just, and just briefly talk about uh, Drill Sergeant Jessica Mitchell. Uh, and as you know, it was, it was around two months ago that, that she was murdered uh, on I-10. Um, this is not a cold case. And myself uh, and, and our North senior leadership, Army senior leadership, is very interested in the investigation going on into Sergeant Mitchell's murder. Uh, I remain actively engaged with both CID and the San Antonio Police Department. And my most recent discussion was with them was two weeks ago. And we will continue to meet with them as we go through time uh, until, we, until we solve this, this case. Um, I, I would like to emphasize right now that you know, there are up to $30,000 in reward money out there. 25000 is coming from CID. Uh, the other 5000 is coming from Crime Stoppers. And, and really, law enforcement needs a tip. If you know anything, uh, that would be very, very helpful. Uh, and please, uh, please contribute information if, if you know something. So, um, JBSA is currently under HPCon Charlie, but the talk is now it's going to go to Bravo next week. And what I would tell you is, it, you know, it, it may not go to Bravo. I think it's going to go to Bravo. Uh, and so, of course, they can put out that information at the uh, JBSA website for the latest as to, as to what's going on. But really, it, you know, what, what's contributed to the reduction going from Charlie to Bravo? It's, it's discipline. It's a, re, it's a uh, reduction in the positivity rate, uh, and that's all caused by the big three, the mask, the hand washing, the social distancing, ah, big four, and the vaccine. Um, and so... Uh, we will continue to keep you informed as to the, the access conditions here on, on uh, Fort Sam Houston. So uh, let's talk about return to the workplace. Even though if it does go down to uh, HPCOM Bravo, uh, excuse me, Charlie, Bravo, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, we're, we're probably going to maintain our same uh, return to the workforce, work, workplace conditions. Uh, and so we know what that is. It hasn't changed, no more than 50% office occupancy at, a time, at any time. And as, as we will increase those percentages uh, at such time that it's safe to do so, and we're confident uh, that you know, we've got a declining positivity rate and we can bring folks in. In the meantime, let's continue with our current plan. No more than 50%. I'm asking for a, 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 a meaningful dialogue between employees and their supervisor. Uh, so that um, they know what's going on. Um, I, I don't want, I, I'm very, um, to su this, is, this remark is to the, the supervisors. Uh, I, I'm very sensitive to those employees out there who may have conditions for which they feel they're very unsafe and they're reluctant. Please have those meaningful conversations. Uh, and if there is just, if there is a, if there's a dispute, uh, a disagreement between the employee and the supervisor elevate that up the chain, and it can come as far as me or Mr. Harmon if, you, if it needs to be, and we'll make the adjudication decision uh, on, on whatever the issue may be. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, so more to follow. We'll keep you informed, and we won't surprise you. We won't say something to the effect of, all right, 80% into work tomorrow. We're not going to do that. It'll be a gradual uh, uh, communication and we'll let you know as to when it's supposed to take effect. Uh, so, you know, the last 48 weeks, um, just to give you some numbers, uh, 860 classes were scheduled to start. We, we executed 704 of them. That's a 92% uh, A grade uh, based off my math. Um, and, and since we started ROM, we've, we've graduated over 19,000 students. And to kind of piggyback on my Opening comments, uh, when we hit the 20,000 soldier, uh, we will definitely make a big deal out of that. No idea who that is yet, but they're out here somewhere. So with that, um, I would like to make sure we have some time to take some questions. Uh, so I will, Tish, do you have any questions from the field? 
Yes, sir. The first one's for you. Uh, why can't MedCOE employees who are considered high risk get the COVID shot now? Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a phased approach as to who gets the COVID shot. And that's because there's only so much uh, vaccine available. However, production and distribution is improving. Um, phase one Bravo, and here are the phases. I know you can't see it, but I keep this with me at all times so that I know what's going on. Uh, includes beneficiaries up to 75 years or older, personnel who perform critical national capabilities, personnel preparing to deploy to locations outside the United States, and frontline essential workers. Working with BAMC and in coordination with R North as well, we further prioritize those med COE employees who have close contact with students as to be part of the population which is go in phase uh, one Bravo. So what I would tell you is that your, your time is coming. Um, stay tuned and, and uh, the vaccine kind of arrives in fits and spurts and sometimes more is received than anticipated. And so what I would tell you is it may be a short notice or no notice call or opportunity um, that one could have to get their shot. Uh, so uh, get it when you can, pay attention. It is phased. Uh, the, the administration uh, is working very aggressively to make sure that there is adequate vaccine distributed nationwide. Um, and what is it, five, five or six percent of our citizens have been vaccinated? It's somewhere low Seven down there. Percent. Pardon? About eight percent. Eight percent now. Okay, good. Yeah. And okay. so, and so we got a we got a long way to go, uh, but that's basically the reason why uh, is because there's only so much, and they have to prioritize that which we do have. Thank you so much, ma'am. The next one is for you. Uh, we got it um, offline, but then we actually have a follow up online. So, as a doctor, would you prefer to get one of the vaccines over the other, and would you want? Uh, would you wait for the one dose Johnson and Johnson vaccine that appears to be in, imminent? That's part one. So part one and two, and then part three that we just got live is: um, Will we on Fort Sam Houston get access to that shot, the Johnson and Johnson? Okay. So great question. So in the news, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine uh, corporation has submitted for the emergency use authorization. That means that they have enough data to support that this is safe and it works uh, and it's a good vaccine to put out there. So we're waiting for that, the oversight for the emergency use authorization um, to be given uh, for that. Right now, here we only have the Pfizer vaccine and I, it's not specific to uh, you know, one brand or another, it's just what we happen to have here right now. So going back to that first question, which vaccine would I get as a physician? The first one that is available uh, and the soonest that you can get protected. So for example, uh, I'm here, emergency department physician. I got my you know, Pfizer vaccine uh, through the emergency department because I'm a frontline worker. Um, my mom and my parents at home, as soon as I could get them a vaccine in the community, um, because they met certain criteria, I did. So whichever one was available, that is the one they got. It happened to be the Moderna one. Um, the issue with the Pfizer one versus the Moderna one, the Pfizer one requires the very deep uh, cooled temperatures to be able to store. So there's certain facilities that have that available versus not. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is coming out it is a one dose, uh, or at least right now, they're saying it is a one dose uh, vaccine. None of these do we have data for any of them saying whether or not we need an additional booster shot. So that's the additional information that you know will have to be achieved for that one. Is it a great one? Yes. If it is available to you, get it. If the Moderna one is available to you first, get that one first. Um, I'm even trying to get my own children uh, into some studies that will get them the vaccine uh, sooner. And you can look online. Uh, FDA.gov has that information available to you. So again, my advice, the soonest you can get something that is approved, so emergency youth authorization says to me as a physician, as an academic physician as well, um, it is safe, it is efficacious, uh, and, and get the vaccine to protect yourself from having these severe complications associated with COVID. 
And there's even literature coming out to say it may prevent you from getting COVID, which is amazing too. Um, I don't think anybody wants to deal with any long-term complications, uh, whether they be small or very grave. Did I answer all the, yes, the, you did. the questions? Part three, <laughs> okay. Sir, the next one's for you. Why are cadre getting the vaccine over trainees, i.e. what makes cadre higher risk than a trainee? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so our trainees are, they are screened and they are tested um, all, all because of your efforts yes, sir. Uh, and your team. Uh, and they basically are training in, in the safety bubble. Uh, we, we popped that bubble for holiday block leave and we've reestablished it and we've worked through the number of positive cases we have. Uh, and we are, we are very confident that the training bubble is safe. Uh, because they are in one spot, they're locked down, they go from their rooms to their classroom and back. They don't leave post. Our instructors and our drill sergeants, many of them live off post. Mm -hmm. And so they are going, traveling about into the community as they go back and forth to home. And then they also, many of them have families who, who are out and about in the community as well. So they are at a higher risk for getting COVID. Uh, therefore, we, we were able to get them uh, the vaccines and that's that's the reason why we'll do that as soon as we can get enough vaccine for uh, our soldiers our trainees uh, then we'll make sure they get vaccinated too thank you so much well with that we will turn it over to closing remarks there aren't any more live questions that we haven't already answered oh wonderful um, I defer to you for to go first all right super um, so you know, I just wanted to put a plug in uh, for our lab. So you mentioned that, sir, during our holiday block leave, um, we established the point of care lab with antigen testing. And, you know, the ultimate goal of all of this is to meet our mission, right? We want to train soldiers. We want to get them out to the force, get them doing their job that they can do. So maintaining the health and welfare as much as possible keeping this, you know, we, we don't want anybody to get sick, not even a mild illness. And so we've started a surveillance program uh, with that as well. So we're only testing uh, people who have no symptoms uh, with the antigen test to see if they're potentially one of those carriers. So a combination of all of these public health efforts is gonna help to keep our formations uh, healthier. Even if you've had the vaccine, it's important to know that you have to continue all of the risk mitigation measures. Because just like you know, when you have your influenza vaccine, you can still get the flu. It just may be a more mild case of that. So we still have to until that population until we get our numbers higher, either by innate immunity or vaccine. We still have to continue mask wear, social distancing, hand hygiene. And it, we've done an incredible job here. I'm super proud of my whole team that has uh, helped to assist this and our movement team as well, you know, getting soldiers where they need to go. I th think they have done uh, an excellent job. So thank you to my entire team and everything um, that has been, you know, helping, you know, to keep the force healthy and to maintain our mission, sir. And it's a pretty small team, which has had huge effects, huge positive impacts. We have a very small team, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks for joining us this time. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. Uh, I just want to foot stomp again. If anybody has any, any information on, on, uh, Staff Sergeant Mitchell, I'd appreciate it, uh, so that we can, we can pass that information to the law enforcement. Uh, right after this event, uh, we will conduct our Black History Month observance. Um, and our guest speaker is, is Dr. Karen Arkandides, and she's the Deputy Commandant for the Non-Commissioned Officer um, Academy. Uh, outstanding speaker, and uh, I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Uh, so please take some time, if you can, to, to stop what you're doing and, and uh, spend some time with us uh, and reflect on the many contributions that, that the African Americans have made uh, building our nation. Um, we continue to make... Uh, tangible efforts towards our commitment to promoting diversity, diversity, uh, inclusion, and making the Medical Center of Excellence have a culture of systemic respect. And I need everybody's help with that. Uh, and we're going to continue to work on this at, at Echelon with a variety of different programs. On this note, our women's panel next week 
on the 3rd of March, uh, in the Academic Support Building, we'll kick off Women's History Month. And that will be a pretty cool event. And it'll also be broadcast on, on MS Team. So I look forward to participating in that as well And, and uh, as we go through uh, March. And we're already at March, which I can't believe how fast time goes by. Uh, I want to thank everybody. A lot of hard work. And we, I, I, I make these these summarizing statements and talking about our volume, our volume of soldiers shipped, our volume of training and education, uh, because they reflect the sum total of our efforts. And it's all because of you and your hard work. Uh, thanks to all, dignity and respect.